Hello students, welcome to this session. In this session, we are going to start with theme 2, unit 2, the measurement of mass and time. Now, when I'm going to start with this chapter, we are first going to refer what we have already known about measurement. Measurement in physics is a very important part as we try to measure different physical quantities. In our day-to-day -day life, you might have considered that sometimes you're measuring some length, some distance, a height, mass, or so on. So, IT measurement comes as the very basis of our day-to-day -day life. Now, when I talk about measurement, how do we define measurement in physics? In physics, we define that when we are measuring a physical quantity, we ideally compare it with a known quantity, we call its unit. Now, when we talk about the mass and the time, we are going to focus our attention on time in this session. So let us first understand what time is. So before we even can measure time, time in physics is defined as an interval or gap between two events. Now what does this mean? Take an example, you all get up at 7 and you do your various stores of the house and yourself to get ready by 7.30 so that you can reach your school by 8. So what are the different events happening in this? Let's say I take the two major events, you getting up and you reaching the school. The time is nothing but the interval that is passing on or the gap between these two times. That is before when you get up and when you reach school, that is between 7 and 8, what is lapsing? It is nothing but the time, right? So for measurement of time, not just we used different kinds of tools such as we always see people wear wristwatches, there are wall clocks at our home, people always look for electronic clocks even in our phones and in our laptop or computer screen we see a small clock always ticking and telling us the time, right? There are clocks such as stopwatches and stop clocks as well. What is stopwatch and stop clock? These are the types of watches which are put into use to actually measure the time lapse between two events that could be very, very small. For example, in a game of marathon or even in a game of chess. So when we talk about all these different tools that we put into use to measure time, we need a unit to define time. So let us understand what unit can be put into use. In our day-to-day -day life, we might come across various units of time. For example, as we say that for my school and for the time being from when I got up, the time difference is one hour. So hour could be the unit, right? Then we say that if I blink my eye, it is blinked in a second of time, right? Or I'll come in one minute. So we always also refer time in minutes. Further, you might have seen that as the day and night happens, we see that day could also be used for defining time. Moreover, if I ask you longer periods, for example, when is your birthday? You may say that my birthday comes on this and this day and it will come again next year. So, even year comes as a unit of time. So there are various units, but we have to understand these units before we go forward to understand time better. So let's start with the earliest of these. Now students, we know today what we know has been founded in very early times. People have started noting little observation in nature and eventually figured out what we know today. So when we talk about earlier day, the length of the day was taken as a unit of time. So in earlier days, it was taken as the unit of time was considered to be the day. Now, how did they got to know what is or how long a day is? Now, they were very observant people. They took it for consideration what happens around us in a very periodic manner. At that time, people didn't know that it is earth that goes around the sun. Rather, they thought that the sun goes around the earth. So what we used to see, let's say this is our earth, we see the sun to rise from the east and set in the west. 
right so when we talk about sun the sun took a path like this right and during the night time we know it will take a path like this and it will again rise the next so how they used to measure the time they saw that sun is exactly overhead during the noon time so they just measured or they just called the time between one noon the sun is overhead till the next time the sun comes back again overhead they defined it as the day and more precisely at least as it was related to sun they defined it as the solar day so how did they define solar day the interval between two successive noons is what they defined as a solar day now we know what is more true here the more true thing is that not the earth but it is the sun which is situated at the center right so when we talk about the actual movement who does go around who the sun is at the center and the earth goes around the sun right now this thing that we see that earth going around the sun is called the revolution whereas we see the setting and the rising of sun because of the rotation of the earth on its own axis right now when we talk about earth rotates about its own axis that is the cause of the day and night but in earlier days as we already discussed they did not know that it is the earth which is moving because they never felt it they thought it is the sun which is moving around the earth rising and setting at its periodic time hence they define the interval between the two successive moons to be a solar day now there is one catch here what is it can you see that the earth while going around the sun sometimes have a greater distance from the sun sometimes it is nearer hence it was changing the day length as well this is something that you might also have observed in your day to day life like in winters the day time becomes shorter right but in summers the day length becomes longer why because of the earth's mutual distance from the sun so as the distance of the earth and the sun is not fixed it keeps on changing due to this it was observed that the length of the solar day was also either increasing or decreasing then even the day length was not fixed then what could be the solution for this the solution for this was to calculate the average so ideally to all figure out what should be the length of a solar day they figure out a term called mean solar day what is mean solar day the average of all the solar days in which the earth completes one revolution not the rotation one revolution around the sun is what we call as mean solar day so if i take there are how many days does the earth take to go around the sun it is 365 days that is one year so if you take the mean of these 365 days day length you will get the mean solar day now once you get the mean solar day the mean solar day was further divided into 24 hours equal intervals and each interval is what we define as an hour so if that is the case can we see that one mean solar day is equivalent to 24 hours so we get the definition of r as well from here further one hour is divided into 60 equal parts which is called minutes so one minute is further divided into 60 equal parts called second one mean solar day is 24 hours one hour is 60 minutes and one minute is what we refer as 60 seconds so this is something that we already know what is it we know that one day is further qualified or divided into 24 hours with one hour each hour connecting with 60 minutes in it and one minute has 60 seconds so if someone ask you how many seconds are there in a day can be calculated yes we can one day is 24 hours with each hour having 60 minutes and each minute having 60 seconds so we are just going to find out how many seconds are there in 
one day. So the number of seconds in one mean solar day is 24 into 60 into 60, which gives me 86,400 seconds. That means I can even write one second is equal to one upon 86,400 part of the mean solar day, right? And if I want to divide the time in R, I can define that one R is one upon 24th of a mean solar day. Same can be done for the minute, it is equivalent to 1 upon 1440th part of the mean solar day. That means we can find all the denomination for time, that is hour, second and even the minute in the terms of mean solar day. But in modern day, we have defined the SI unit of time to be second. And how do we define second? Second is defined as the standard unit of time which is equivalent to 1 upon 86,400th part of the mean solar day. Right? Now when I talk about different things such as unit of time which could be used that is required for measuring longer periods. Definitely second is not going to help us. So in that case we go for bigger units of time that may be a year, a decade, a century or even a millennium. Right? Their relation with the SI unit of time is what we can see in this table. Let's check this out. So we know the SI unit of time is what? It is second, right? We know that 60 seconds come together to make one minute, where 60 minutes further come together to make one hour. 24 such hours make one day and 365 such days make one year. The time that the earth takes to go around the earth, right? Then we come to a decade. 10 years is what we call as a decade, right? 10 years is what we call as a decade. And when we make these 10 years into 10, that is 100 years, 10 decades make a century. Now, when we talk about even multiplying this with 10 years, that is 1000 years, 10 centuries come together to make one millennium. So we have seen that time can be measured in second, in days, in years, in decades, in centuries, in millennium. But what is the SI unit of time? Second. And when we talk about second, how do we define second? It is 1 upon 86,400th of a mean solar day. Right? Now, when we talk about time, as I already mentioned, we, what we know today has been laid in the early days, it is the foundation that has been laid already. So, in early days, there were no digital clocks, no analog clocks, no watches. People didn't used to wear wristwatches in their hand, they didn't have a hanging clock in their home. Then how did they used to read the time? They used to read the time using the various things around them. For example, the resources such as water, sand and sun. They have made clocks such as water clock, sand clock and sundials. So when I talk about water clock, it was very interestingly made with a conical flask with an opening in the below and the water is filled in this conical flask. With every hour passing, the water dripped from the conical flask, one of the graduated marking and hence the people used to get to know the time that yes, the time is lapsing by that much amount. The same thing is observed in a sand clock. In a sand clock, the sand is put in a flask which has a very small opening in the middle and the sand used to drip from this or flow from this very slowly. So there were different kind of sand clocks that were made for different time lapse. Now when we talk about sand clocks, do we use these kind of sand clocks which is also called as an hourglass today as well? Yes, in the board games. These are put into use in board games. Then comes the sundials. Now there were kings who used to make giant structure using the power of the sun and the phenomena of shadow. They used to measure the time. So when we were talking about different kinds of sundials, they were found in India in different regions. So some of the historic sundials which still exist in India is situated in Ujjain 
in Varanasi, in Jaipur, in Delhi and one is at Mathura. Now what is very interesting, you might have heard of Jantar Mantars. The Jantar Mantar is nothing but a giant sundial. They were designed by Maharaja Jai Singh II of Jaipur. So he was very fond of these sundials. He was very fascinated that he could tell time. And hence he started making big structures with the name of Jantar Mantar in various places in India. Right? Now in the sundial, the time is indicated using these the phenomena of sun and the shadow formation. So they used to tell the time very, very accurately. But there were two drawbacks of this sundial. What could it be? As it uses sun, what about when the sun sets? That means the sundials was not able to work during the night time. Moreover, they were weather dependent. What is it? Let's say Raja Maharaja were sitting in the sundial just trying to read the clock and suddenly the weather changes and the clouds come. When the clouds come, the it is going to shade over the sun and there will be no shadow forming of the sundial. Hence, they were weather dependent. They were not be able to read on cloudy days. Hence, it was not perfect, but slowly and steadily we reached to the modern day watches. We call them as mechanical watches. Even the further uh, advancement of mechanical watches have led us to do electronic clocks. Now, when I talk about mechanical watches, they are also called as quartz watches. Why? Because in mechanical watches, we use the principle of vibration of quartz crystals to tell the time. So, moreover, when we talk about what is the further advancement of this, today our phone screens, our laptops, our systems, everywhere we see a clock that can tell us the time accurately. So, this is what we have seen from sundials to the electronic watches. Moreover, as I told you, stop watches and stop clocks are used which can be started as well as stopped at will. So we can definitely tell how much time is lapsed between the two events if we are using a stopwatch. So stopwatches are still put into use in quiz contests, right? Even in some events such as when an athlete is running a race of 100 meter, how much time he or she is taking, we use it, the stopwatch. Or even for a particular experiment, how much time has lapsed, stopwatches are very helpful. On the other hand, stop clocks are used in game of chess. So we have seen that watches have gone through a lot of changes, but it has been an integral part of us understanding and measuring time, right? 